there is a reason that we have 66 inspired and preserved books. The theme of the Bible would be this. The salvation of man through Jesus Christ to the glory of God. And obviously all of that is qualified by being revealed in the Bible by the Holy Spirit himself. Now when we consider this, the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John also have themes. Some of them may say that these are the four Gospels. That's fine. As long as we recognize Galatians 1, 6 through 9 says there's only one Gospel. The best way to sum up Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John would be to say that they are about the life of Christ. The theme of Matthew would be this. Matthew portrays Christ as king, specifically as king of the Jews, but really the king of the whole world. When we look at the book of Mark, you'll see words like straightway, forthwith, immediately. It's only 16 chapters, and Jesus is very busy, but he is the busy, suffering servant. When we read the book of Luke, we'll see that Luke portrays Jesus as the total man. Matter of fact, he's referred to many times as the Son of Man. And then there's the book of John. And John portrays Jesus as the Son of God. The eternal Word who existed before the beginning, who existed in eternity, and created every single thing that was made. What we're going to do over the next several Sunday mornings, 20 some, we're going to preach the entire book of John. We're going to have this introductory lesson. We're going to look at the signs, the I am's, and then we're going to hit chapter 1. So every week will be an entire chapter. And we plan on doing all 21 chapters of the book of John that way. But if you're anything like me, in order to understand what you read, I need a big picture. This sermon is the big picture. Hopefully this sermon will help us get an understanding of the book. Hopefully we will go read the book. And then we will preach the things that the book contains. Therefore, this sermon is entitled, That Ye Might Believe, an introduction to John. Here's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to have three points in this sermon. The first one, we're going to talk about John the man. We're going to observe that John was prosperous and that John was privileged. That would be the first point that we're going to talk about. The second point, the second main thing we're going to talk about is an overview of the book itself. We're going to get some background information on the book and then we're going to break the book down. And hopefully it will be in such a way that when we read, we can read with the understanding and grasp the book a little bit better. The third thing that we're going to discuss this morning are the signs and the I am's of the book of John. And obviously we'll talk about the seven signs first and then we will observe the seven I am's. There are the bones. Now let's put some meat on the bones. The first thing we're talking about. John the man and John the man being prosperous. John was a fisherman by trade in Matthew 4.21 and Mark 1.19 make that very plainly clear. Now as we'll observe some of the things from the reading of the text, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are generally referred to as the synoptic gospels. Now again, I've said my piece on that. But understand, there are a lot of similarities in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John is about 90% totally different. But when we read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we'll see some similarities. And one of those similarities in getting the, the picture of John the man, first that he was a fisherman, but his brother James and Peter were also partners in this fishing business with him according to Luke 5 and verse number 10. What we also observe about John is that John left his business. He left his family to follow Jesus. Jesus told them very plainly. He looks at these fishermen and says, I will make you a fisher of men. Go from a fisher man to a fisher of men. We'll observe that in Mark, Matthew 4.22, in Mark 1.20, and also in Luke 5.11. 
And sometimes we get this picture that John and his brother James and Peter and Andrew, when they were called, is that they just had no idea. This guy named Jesus walks up and says, follow me. And they say, yeah, we don't have any idea who this guy is. Let's just quit what we're doing. Let's just leave our business behind and go follow him. Now observe that third bullet right there. It was not a rash or a hasty decision. And that is because apparently John the Apostle was a disciple of John the Baptist. John the Baptist, as we generally call him and recognize, he was the forerunner for Christ. And he had disciples and he was teaching his disciples very plainly. I'm not the Christ. I'm not the Messiah. I'm the one, the road paver, making straight the pathway for the Lord. And we can observe, though John's name is not specifically called in John 1, verses 35 through 37, the reasonable conclusion is, is that John was one of those disciples that was following John the Baptist. And therefore, he had had sufficient teaching about the Messiah and about the Christ. And therefore, when Jesus says, follow me, he knew who he was following. He knew he was leaving the forerunner and following the Messiah himself. His family, the second thing here, possessed hired servants. Therefore, John had some type of monetary gain from his business. It doesn't appear that he was just scraping by. He had a very prosperous fishing business, and we can observe that from Mark 1 and verse number 20. The third thing about John the man and being prosperous is that he was dependable. We put that up there because when we consider dependability, John's fishing business, by all intents and purposes, was not just a fly-by-night business. He was a dependable man. He established his own business. He had business partners. His family had hired servants. And in John 19, verses 25 through 27, Jesus says very plainly, For John the apostle, the disciple whom he loved, and we'll establish that, to watch over his mother. When we read the rest of the New Testament, Jesus had half-brothers and sisters. But why does he tell the apostle John to watch over his mother? I don't know, but that's what he told him. And when we also observe from Galatians 2 and verse 9, John the apostle was a pillar, so-called pillar, in the church at Jerusalem. So he was a very, very dependable man. He was a prosperous man. He had his fishing business, but he left everything to follow the Lord. And that was not something that was done rashly or just on the spur of the moment. He was well taught and he knew who he was following. Now let's talk about John the man being privileged. And from this aspect, we're really going to look at him as being privileged with Jesus, with Jesus the Christ. The first thing we can observe about John the Apostle being privileged is that he was part of what is generally looked at as the inner three. Yes, he was one of the twelve, but Jesus also had what we are is generally referred to as the inner three. Why are they referred to as the inner three? Here's why. In Matthew 17, 1 through 5, there were only three of the apostles there. They got to witness firsthand the Lord's transfiguration. Who were they? Peter, James, and John. Observe also in Gethsemane, in our Lord's, probably our Lord's darkest and most grievous hour, there were three that went with him to pray. Who were those three? In Matthew 26, 36 through 46, and also in Mark 14, 32 through 42, Peter, James, and John. John was a very privileged man with Jesus. He got to see things and observe things that apparently the others did not. The second thing here is that John the apostle was present at Christ's trial and you could also maybe say Christ's trials. In John 18 verses 15 and 16, here's how we see something of John and his business and his personality. John knew the high priest. And in, to be a Jew in those days, there was no greater power of position than being the high priest. So if you knew the high priest, you were somebody. John knew the high priest. How do we know that? Peter was only allowed in in John 18, 15, and 16 where the trial was taking place because John knew the high priest and he knew the woman at the door. 
So John had some pull. John was a privileged man. The third thing we observe here about John being privileged and specifically with Jesus is that he was the first apostle. Now observe that. I didn't say he was the first person. I said he was the first apostle at the empty tomb according to John chapter 20 verses 4 through 6 and simply the only reason that John beat Peter is because he outran him. They were both running but John the apostle just flat out outran him. Now what does that say about him? I don't know but he was faster than Peter at least on his feet. John the Apostle was a prosperous man. John the Apostle was a privileged man. The fourth thing that we're going to observe here about John, he is the disciple whom Jesus loved. And the disciple whom Jesus loved is the author of what we refer to as the book of John. You will not find John the Apostle's name anywhere in this book, but it's still entitled John. Why is that? Some of the most ancient manuscripts inscribe it to him. But when we consider the inner three, it has to be Peter, it has to be James, and it has to be John. So when we consider this, it couldn't be Peter, first off. Because in John 13, 24, generally what we refer to as the Last Supper, he beckons the disciple whom Jesus loves and says, Hey, ask him. Hey, ask him who it is that's going to betray him. Therefore, Peter is not referred to in this book as the disciple whom Jesus loved. Well, James was also part of that inner three. But there's another interesting aspect here. James was beheaded by Herod around A.D. 44, according to Acts 12, 1 through 2. Now, I believe the book of John was written probably earlier than what most people do, but I'm not so sure it was written before A.D. 44. So for all intents and purposes, John the apostle's brother James could not be the disciple whom Jesus loved, as is recorded in the pages of the Bible. The third bullet there, John is the only reasonable Conclusion. Now there's not a scripture that, that says that flat out, but you'll observe in your Bible, whatever it is, you'll note this is the book of John. So the only reasonable conclusion, because whomever the disciple whom Jesus loved was, is really, he is the inspired writer of the book five times in this book. In John 13, 23, in John 19, 26, in John 22, in John 21, 7, and in John 21, 20, he is referred to specifically as the disciple whom Jesus loved. Bottom point here. Keep this in mind. Now when we read about the disciple whom Jesus loved, the Bible has to harmonize. In Acts 10, 34 and 35, Peter said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. But in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. Also in 1 Peter 2 in verse number 22 in speaking of Jesus, who did no guile, nor was any deceit in his mouth. So whatever is referred to about John being the disciple whom Jesus loved, Jesus did not show partiality. He did not show respect of persons, but it may be like this. Of all the people in this congregation, I might not be the preacher whom you love. Of all the people that are in this congregation, it may not be that the person sitting on the opposite end of the pew of you, you would refer to as my dearly beloved friend so-and-so. That doesn't mean you don't love them. That doesn't mean you don't care for them. But there are some things and some personalities that click. There are some people that you get along better with than others. Is that an attack against your character? Indeed it is not. There are people that I get along better with than others. Is that an attack against my character? I don't believe that it is. When the Bible refers to as the disciple whom Jesus loved, is that an attack on Christ's character? Most certainly it is not. Now let's move on to point number two. Let's give an overview of the book here and let's give a background. And again, I've got some numbers up here with question marks and if any of you all spend any time with me, Counting, once I get off my ten fingers and ten toes, it's highly questionable. So all these numbers, I put a question mark there because I believe I'm right. Now, I'm not teaching that as gospel that <laughs> these all are in there. 
But you count them for yourself, and I think I've got pretty close. There are 21 chapters in the book of John. I feel pretty comfortable about that. I feel also pretty comfortable about there being 879 verses, but I may have gotten that off. Now, when I put here 19,094 words, yeah, you might want to check that. But I believe it's pretty close, and I did my best to be as accurate as I could. So there are a lot of words in this book of the Bible. From my count, from what I understand, the word Father, beyond any shadow of a doubt, is in the book more than 100 times. It might be 138. But I feel confident in saying that the word Father, and most of the time, though not every time, it is in reference to the Father of Lights. There are some occasional ones where a human father is referred to, but most of the time, John shows us the Father. And we'll see as we go through the book, that is what some of the disciples say. Show us the Father. And it will suffice. We'll believe. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The word believe, and also you may hear this, that the, the book of John is referred to as the gospel of belief, or the gospel that causes one to believe. I've said my piece on the word gospel. But the word believe is in the book more than 100 times. It might be 102 or so. The word world is in the book more than 70 times. So John is showing us, really from this aspect, his is a universal gospel. It's not just to portray anything to the Jews or to the Romans or to the Greeks. It's more of a universal book directed toward everyone. The word witness or testify gives the idea of, I saw this. This was seen. It's in the book more than 30 times. The word love in its different forms and fashions are in the book, is in the book more than 30 times. The word life is in the book more than 30 times. And now my, one of my favorite phrases that Jesus, from my count, is the only one that said this, verily, verily, truly, most assuredly, you can bank on this. What I'm about to say, what Jesus says here, you can know it's right. You can know it is truth. And Jesus says that in this book alone more than 20 times. What's the purpose of the book of John? If you'll look with me in your Bibles, we'll observe this passage. It was part of our scripture reading, but it never hurts to read it again. In John 20, verses 30 and 31... John sets forth the purpose behind his writing. He says this, and many other signs. The word signs here means something to prove or authenticate. Therefore, Jesus' recorded miracles prove something to us. John says, and truly many other signs. Jesus did a lot of signs. Miracles were, in part, to reveal truth and to confirm truth. This same word signs, as used in John 20 and verse 30, is in the book 17 times. I think I've got that one right. And of those 17 times, 13 times it is translated either miracle singular or miracles plural. It would be just as scriptural for John to say or for the King James translators, and maybe your Bible says that, and many other miracles. Thus, John is a book we'll observe of recorded miracles. And many other signs truly did Jesus, the verse continues, in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book. You know that the written word is better than oral tradition? Of all the things that I may do, the sloppiest that I'll ever do is in my speech. If I were to sit down and write something, my written word is a whole lot better than my spoken word. And that's generally true with anyone. You can see, you can put more thought into it. You can observe the things and put down exactly what you want. Written words are more precise and one key thing to it is it says the same thing every single time you read it. Whether you sit down this afternoon and read the book of John or not, you read it today, it's going to say the same thing when you pick it back up tomorrow. It's going to say the same thing when you pick it up ten years from now. Thus these miracles are written. 
In Ephesians 3, verses 3 and 4, Paul makes it very clear. How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge of the mystery. In the same book, in Ephesians 5 and verse 17, Paul says, Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Therefore, when we read the book of John, we can understand it. And not just the book of John, every other book of the Bible. It is written, it is recorded, and it is for our understanding so that we can understand and obey the things that are contained therein. Another purpose of the book here, and still continuing through the verse, and many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of His disciples, which are not written in this book, but, verse 31... These are written, these recorded signs, the entire book is written, that ye might believe. These miracles happened and they were recorded by inspired men and the inspired apostle John, written down for all time so that it will cause belief. It will cause us to believe. What, is, what does it mean to believe? Confidence, trust, conviction, Faith is produced by the written evidences of God's Word. Romans 10, 17 makes that very clear. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. In the first century that was absolutely true. But now whereby when we read, we may understand, we read the inspired book. As an incidental, many books exist today to destroy the faith. There are many books written. Your children will probably have to study some of them if they go and get their higher education. There are many books written to destroy the faith, but only one. Only one book in the entire world produces faith, and that's the Bible. God's inspired word. John wrote and was inspired to write, but these are written that ye might believe. What do we need to believe, John? He's, given, he's telling us flat out why he wrote that Jesus is the Christ. He is the Messiah. He is the anointed one. He is the Son of God. John does an excellent job at doing that, by the way. In John 1, 1 through 5, we observe and note in the beginning was the Word. The Word is Jesus. Jesus already existed in eternity. The Word was with God and the Word was God. Some of our religious friends try to teach us in their so-called Bibles that Jesus was a God. That's an utter lie. He is God. He is divine. He is a member of the Godhead. Generally, we refer to him as the second member of the Godhead. John shows us that Jesus, as the Word, is the eternal creator of everything. We also observe in John 1.14, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus, as the Word, became a man. And He dwelt among us as a man. John shows us beyond any shadow of a doubt that God dwelt among us in the flesh as Jesus Christ. John also shows us that Jesus is the only begotten Son. And in John 1 and verse number 18, he makes that clear. No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared Him. He hath exegeted Him. He has expounded unto us what the Father is. And that's why Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You see everything and we can read and understand everything we need to know about the Father through Jesus Christ. And whereby when we read, we can understand these principles. The verse continues, But these are written, that you might believe that Jesus is the, Son, is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through His name. Life is the exact opposite of death. We've defined death many times. Death is very simply separation. 
So John has written and recorded these miracles for us that we might have life. What is life? It is joining, it is unity, it is togetherness. It may be well said that it is fellowship. The main life under consideration in John 20 verse 30 and 31 is spiritual life. And spiritual life leads to eternal life. To that permanent eternal joining of fellowship and sweet togetherness with the Godhead. Jesus says this plainly in John 10, 10. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come, Jesus says, that they might have life and that they might have it, that's life, more abundantly. Jesus came so that we may have the abundant life. Do you have the abundant life? Because the abundant life is only found in Christ. Date of the book. I'm probably the only person you'll ever meet that'll say this. The book of John, like every other book of the Bible, was written before A.D. 70. Now generally when this is looked at, the only books that anyone that's conservative or any by any definition that puts after A.D. 70 are John's five books. I believe there's sufficient evidence. And when you read the book of John or anything really that John wrote, we'll talk about Revelation one day, they're difficult to date just from the things that are in there. But I think we can give here some good reasoning behind that. First off, there are no mention of the Jewish wars. The Jewish wars began in A.D. 66, and when you consider that aspect, there's no mention of the Jewish wars in the book of John, nor any other inspired book. When you read the writings of Josephus, I'm the first one to say Josephus was uninspired. But Josephus lived through that time. Read that. And if there's any semblance of truth to that, they were terrible. It was bloody. It was vicious. It was awful. Nowhere is it mentioned in the book of John. The second bullet, there's no mention of the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 7. Now that was a huge occurrence. If you don't think so, read Matthew 24, the first 35 verses, and see the things that took place. But also read the uninspired writings of Josephus, and he records that 1.1 million Jews died. Talk about a holocaust. Talk about a bloodbath. Nowhere is it mentioned. It's very odd to me that that's nowhere mentioned. Now when we consider this, the AD 70 destruction of Jerusalem is mentioned in other books, but without question it is mentioned prophetically. What do you mean by prophetically? It is spoken of before it happened. When Jesus is speaking in Matthew 24, and even when Matthew wrote Matthew 24, what we call, AD 70 had not happened. If it did then that would taint the inspiration of Matthew. But if, and it can be established, that Matthew wrote before A.D. 70, it's well known that Jesus said it before A.D. 70. The only way that can happen is by inspiration. That helps establish the inspiration of these books. Incidentally, in Matthew 24, 21, Jesus says this, For then, then when? Then in the time period up to and leading to A.D. 70. Then shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time. No, uh-oh, nor ever shall be. Now that was a bad time to be alive. Consider this also. Eyewitness testimony carries more weight the sooner it is made known, the sooner it is verified, and the sooner it is recorded. Now just think of this. What kind of weight would that carry with some people if John wrote some 60 years after the fact? Now, there's an incidental in this that is key. Inspiration is granted. We grant inspiration. It would not be totally unheard of to say that a person wrote many years after the fact and wrote it correctly. For example, consider the book of Genesis. There's little doubt that Moses wrote the book of Genesis and he most assuredly most assuredly, was not there moment one of creation. But how did he know what happened? He was inspired to write. The point being this. I, John is claiming to be an eyewitness. If you were an eyewitness to anything, when is your testimony going to carry the most weight? 60 years after the fact? I don't think so. That's an incidental, but there's something else to this. Micah 7.15 is the main reason why I say this. Micah is speaking of something that 
is generally referred to as a prophetic type. That means it had a meaning right when he said it, right when it was recorded, but he's pointing ahead to something else. The same principles involved with Isaiah 7.14. Micah 7.15 says this, According to the days of thy coming out of the land of Egypt will I show unto him, that has to be the church, marvelous things. This same word marvelous in Micah 7.15 is translated as miracles. In Judges 6.13 and in Numbers 14.33-35, there is no question that there was a 40-year period before they came out of the wilderness. So what is this? It is a prophetic type for the church of Christ to come that there would be a 40-year period of miracles added up. No matter whether it began with John the Baptist, no matter whether it began with the church in Acts 2, add 40 to either one of those and see what you come up with. That's teaching something. Point being this. The book of John, in my opinion, and I don't bind this as a law, but I think I've given adequate testimony as far as biblical testimony to establish that the book of John was written before A.D. 70. Now let's break down this book. There are four main parts, I believe, to the book of John. The first one is, and again, we noted from John 20, 30, and 31, this establishes the deity of Christ. So all these points revolve around Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus the Christ, being the Son of God. The first part of the book in chapters 1 through 12. This is the Son of God and His public ministry. By public we mean this. The primary part of chapters 1 through 7, which is subpoint A, he basically is in Galilee. Now he does go up and down, and we'll, we'll have a map up here in a second that you can look at this. But basically, the first seven chapters is in regard to his northern ministry in the land of Galilee, which include the cities of Cana and Capernaum. The B sub point here under the main point, his public ministry, is in Judea. That's his southern ministry. That primarily takes place in Jerusalem and in Bethany. That's chapters 8 through 12. The second part of this book... This is very key. This is very key. If we do not understand the second Roman numeral here, the Son of God and His private ministry, if we don't understand who is speaking and to whom is being spoken to in John chapters 13 through 17, we'll be in a denominational mess like most people are. This is the Son of God and His private ministry. The subpoint under there, A, in chapter 13, Judas Iscariot departs. Now you could also say that's where Jesus washes the disciples or the apostles' feet, but Judas Iscariot departs in this chapter. Then, in chapters 14, 15, and 16, we see the apostolic promises made. Key to understanding this, when we read John 14, 15, and 16 specifically, Jesus is speaking only to His apostles. So where there's the promise of the Holy Spirit, you're going to have to stretch the text to make that mean you. That is a miraculous inspiration that is promised to the apostles. Not to me, not to you, not to any other soul that ever was. And in chapter 17, we observe what is really the Lord's Prayer. This is the Lord's Prayer, and it is Christ's prayer for unity. That's the first two sections. Now let's bust out the last two sections here. The third point, the third breakdown of the book of John is the Son of God and His passion. You may note the P's up here. That will aid in memory, hopefully. And that's in chapters 18 and 19. In chapter 18, we'll observe Christ's arrests, arrest, singular, and trials, plural. And in chapter 19, that is the Son of God's scourging, and his death, his burial, and it was a terrible time. But the fourth part of the book still comes. And that's the Son of God and the power of his resurrection in chapters 20 and 21. Chapter 20 is his resurrection, and chapter 21 shows the results of his resurrection. I do hope this helps you. This is not to waste time. If you will read the book and understand these things that are going on, it will only help. It will not hinder by any means. Here's a map. I don't know how well you can see this. But basically when you look, there's an orange type area near the top. That's marked as Galilee. That 
that's where basically the first seven chapters of the book takes place. And if you, I don't know if you can see it, but you'll see Cana, and then you'll see the Sea of Galilee, and then Capernaum is right there on the, the tip. But you'll see a pink area in the middle. That's Samaria. And we'll observe that Christ did a great work in Samaria. And most Jews walked all the way around. They walk all the way. They would, you, you know that the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. The easiest way to go from Galilee into Judea, which is the yellow part there, would be to walk straight through Samaria. But most Jews hated the Samarians so bad they'd walk all the way around. Jesus didn't. He said, I must needs go through Samaria. Praise God Almighty for that. So when we go through this book, we'll note... Primarily, Jesus' ministry was in Galilee and in Judea, but he also did some great work in Samaria as well. Now let's talk about the third thing, the signs and the I am's. The signs are the miracles. There are seven of them, really, but eight, because his resurrection, if that's not a miracle, I don't know what a miracle is. But we'll observe seven of them. And really his resurrection, according to Romans 1, 4, is what declared him to be the Son of God with power. The first we'll observe is where Jesus turned the water into wine. In John 2, verses 1 through 11, we've spoken enough on wine, and we'll speak on that again when we get there. What's the point behind that miracle? That shows the Son of God's power over the laws of nature. No matter what, there is a time period that is taken into there, even if it's from going and getting the, the grapes from the vine and squeezing them out. Jesus totally di disregarded that law. That shows his power over the laws of nature. The second of the seven signs is the healing of the nobleman's son in John 4, 46 through 54. When this happened, Jesus was not standing over this young man, whatever he may have been. He was a good piece away, and as you'll observe what the text reads, when Jesus told him that he was better, he was better right then. It was not a process, and what does this show? This shows the Son of God's power over time and also over distance. He did not have to be in the same room with anyone ever to do anything good for them. The third one, the healing of the lame man. In John 5, 1 through 9, I believe we'll observe that this man was lame for 38 years. And Jesus says, Arise, take up thy mat and walk. What does this show? This shows the Son of God's power over disease. You can't hold him. You can't stop him. And the book of John very clearly demonstrates the power of Christ. The fourth sign, the feeding of the 5,000 with the five loaves and two fishes, if memory serves, in John 6, 1 through 15. What does that show? That shows the Son of God's power to supply man's needs. What did the Bible say in John 20, 30, and 31? There are many other signs that Jesus did, but these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. The fifth sign where Jesus walks on the water in John 6, verses 16 through 21. This shows that Jesus has power and really is the master over nature itself. Of all the tempestuous things and of all the problems that could go on in anyone's life, if Jesus can calm the water, he can handle you. And whatever your storms in life are, no problem. The sixth sign, the healing of the man born blind. Not just became blind or had had that infirmity that something happened to him. He was born blind and never seen anything in his life. In John 9, 1 through 7, Jesus also has power over physical senses. These things are written to cause conviction, to help us realize if Jesus helped then, he can help now. The seventh sign, Lazarus raised from the dead in John eleven thirty three 33 through 44. That shows Jesus' power over death. Death cannot hold the Son of God. We do not serve a dead and buried Savior. We serve a risen Savior. And He is able to help us. Who could question? Who in their right mind could question the power of Jesus Christ after reading these recorded miracles? I don't know. Somebody will. And somebody always does. Now let's talk about the I Am's. I think we recognize in Exodus 3, and the Jews recognize this also, the I am can only be applied to God. 
There's no question about it. Now, if I were to say I am a husband, well, that's, that's commonplace. But if I were to say before Abraham was I am, there ain't no way that could be unless I'm God Almighty. The first, Jesus says, I am the bread of life in John 6, through 71. The lesson is that Christ is to the spiritually hungry what food is to those who hunger physically. Are you hungry this morning? I'm sure that you are physically. Do we spiritually hunger? Christ is the answer. If you're hungry spiritually, partake of Christ. How do we partake of Christ? We partake of Christ's teachings. We obey the gospel. The second of the seven I am's. Jesus says, I am the light of the world in John 8, 12 through 20. Christ is the spiritual light of the entire world. Why? Because He has all authority. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Christ makes that very, very plain. A light is a good thing. And we'll talk about that probably some in the weeks to come. The third of the seven great I am's. Jesus says, I am the great I am. In John 8, 46 through 59. Christ makes five bold statements in this discussion that prove. Now really I could have added something else up here, but it proves one of two things. Either he's eternal and divine or he is flat out crazy. He's a flat out lunatic. He's a, he's a demon possessed person. Oh, like they claimed him to be. But he is most assuredly not. He is the great I am. The fourth of the seven I am's. He is the door and the good shepherd, the double I am, some people may say, in John 10, 1 through 21. And the lesson and the teaching here is that Christ presents a sharp contrast between any and all these false teachers of that day, and by implication, any other day, and himself. He is not an hireling. He's not a thief. He's not a robber. The thief cometh but to steal, kill, and destroy. But I am come that they might have life, and life more abundantly. Therefore, he is the door, and he is the good shepherd. Jesus is also, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. In John 11, 1 through 27, Christ is the source of all life physical and spiritual, and incidentally, He is the source of the resurrection. Baptism is referred to in the Bible in Romans 6, 1 through 4 as a resurrection. By without Christ's death, without Him shedding His blood, baptism would do no good. But since He did, and since He teaches us what to do, baptism cleanses us from all sins in accordance with our belief, repentance, and confession. Jesus says, I am the way... I am the truth and I am the life. In John 14, 1 through 6, and Christ shows that the only way, not one of a, a thousand ways, not one of any universalism type teaching, there's only one way to the Father and that is through Jesus Christ. There's only one way to life everlasting and it's not through Buddha, through Hare Krishna, nor through any other false god that ever was or could be. Life everlasting is only found in and through Jesus Christ. Jesus is my hero. I don't know about you. The seventh of the seven I am's. Jesus says, I am the true vine. In John 15, 1 through 8, and Christ shows that true spiritual life is found only in Him. Apart from the true vine, we have no life. And He is the head of the body, the church who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that he might have the supremacy, the preeminence of all and everything. Are you in the true vine? Are you in Christ? Do you know that you have eternal life and promise? What have we talked about? We've had three main points. John the man, he was prosperous, he was privileged. We've given an overview of the book. We've given the background and the breakdown. We've given the third thing with the signs and the I am's, and we've discussed those things. John was inspired to write so that we might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and what an outstanding job he did. There's no fault that can be laid at the apostles' feet. If we don't get it, it's not his fault. It's our fault. John presents the evidence in a clear and a compassionate manner. The book of John has the ability to soften 
the hardest of men's hearts to the gospel truth of Jesus Christ, but. There's always a but. If the gospel of John can soften, then it can also harden. The same sun that melts butter also hardens the clay. The book of John also contains the capability to cause people to reject the truth and to remain in their lost condition. Our prayer is that we all have honest and good hearts and will accept and obey the glorious gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Brock, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? I'm going to tell you what Jesus said in John 3, 3 through 5. Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, came to Jesus by night. Why did he come by night? I don't know. I'll leave it alone. fact is, he came by night. And he was confused. He says, Master, we know that no one can do these miracles thou doest except God be with him. And Jesus said, answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, most assuredly you can write this down and bank on it. I say unto thee, except unless a man be born again, born anew, born from above, he cannot, not he might not, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus is confused. Nicodemus saith unto them, How can a man be born when he is old? Brock, you told me I need to be born again. I don't get that. Well, Nicodemus didn't either. So let's see if we can explain that. Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, write this down most assuredly. This is truth. I say unto thee, The great I am, except a man be born of water. That does not mean embryonic fluid. If it means embryonic fluid, I'll put a glass of water here and we'll get a glass of embryonic fluid here and see which one you drink. The water here is water and it refers to baptism. Except the man be immersed. Except the man be buried with Christ. Born of water and of the Spirit. Literally, the Greek text re reads, born of water and spirit. You could make the case that that capitalized S should be a lowercase s. That there's something needs to be going on in your head. That you need to recognize I'm lost. That in accordance with my belief, repentance, and confession, this immersion cleanses my sins. Add, the Lord will add me to my church. But even if it's supposed to be a capitalized S, the only two times that the new birth is spoken is here and in 1 Peter 1. Seeing you purified your souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again. How? Not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. By what? By the Word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and the glory of man is as the flower of the grass. The grass withereth. And the flower thereof falleth away, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. Have you obeyed the gospel? You need to obey the gospel. If you've obeyed the gospel and you're not walking in the light, walk in the light. Be in fellowship with the Godhead. You know what to do. Do it now. As together we stand and sing the song of encouragement. He is my